from my time as a scientist. Water flows downhill. So I found a little creek, a little trickle, and I followed it. And it joined another little creek. And I followed it no matter which way it went, because I knew it would be going in the right direction. So I followed it and followed it and followed it as it got bigger and bigger until I got underneath the cloud cover and I could see my directions, I was safe. And that's the simile I've used you know, to answer your question. Which is the correct path? You know that if it really is you know, the teachings of a Buddha, if it is really going to lead to something worthwhile, it has to be increasing in peace, in happiness, clarity, joy, kindness, all those qualities which you associate you know, with the spiritual path. If it leads to the opposite, then you go in the wrong direction. So you go in the right direction, more peace, more kindness, more harmony, more health, mental and physical, you know that that must be the right direction. And I don't care what you call it, if it goes in that direction, carry on. And if you can't tell whether this is working for you, ask your partner. If after this talk you're more of a pain in the neck than you were before, don't follow this path. <laughs> okay, so that's a little thing about that. You feel what is going in the correct direction. It's the same you're going to learn now with this meditation. So, if you'd like to get yourselves nice and comfy, and it's great, these chairs, I can actually cross, cross my legs. Sorry? What? The chair. Yeah. I agree. You don't always agree. <laughs> I never agree. Okay, so I'm principled. <laughs> Here we go. Oops. Getting there. Okay. Lead off. Very good. So, close your eyes and then become aware of how your body is sitting, whether it's comfortable or not. I used to sit cross-legged because it's about whew, seven years I never sat on a chair. I didn't have chairs. I got used to sitting cross-legged and it's comfortable. So when you've got your eyes closed, become aware of your physical posture. Is it comfortable? This is just a general actually quite superficial awareness of your body. It's a start. And then to make it more refined, become aware, send your mindfulness to your legs. How are your legs positioned now? Mine are crossed, they're pretty crossed in a good way. Yours may be dangling off the end of a chair. Maybe next time you feel uncomfortable you can try a cushion underneath your bottom to raise it up if you've got long legs. Put a cushion or stool underneath your feet if you've got short legs. In other words, to try and find the optimum comfortable position for your legs. You can try moving your feet forward, moving them back, moving them apart. Whatever it takes to get your legs comfortable. To be able to do that you need mindfulness awareness of the sensations and the feelings in the body. You're not thinking about this, you're experiencing those sensations directly. And as you learn to experience the feelings, the sensations, no need to give them a name because many of those uh, physical feelings in your legs don't have a name. You just know them. And once you have awareness, of the legs and its feelings. Then see if you can relax them. Moving the legs this way or that way until you can get to the best position for your legs. You've taken time. You've been meticulous. You've cared for your legs. And then you go to your bottom, your butt, 
In Buddhism, we don't kick butt, we care for butt. So, if you need to fidget, please do so. Sometimes we just pay no attention to that part of our body, which is why it gets sore, and why often I see people coming out of meditation because they've got very painful bottom. They haven't been careful enough to put it in a good position to begin with. It's all about mindfulness and caring for your body. And then you move up to your back. People have many problems with backs. So you become aware of your back, however it is. What does it feel like? And you need to move it forward or back, left or right. As you move, if you do move, feel the sensations in your back. And see which position is the most comfortable. In meditation practice, you don't always have the same posture every time. It changes. And you find the one which suits you today, this afternoon, here. Oh, and I should also say, I know that one of my books is called Good, Bad, Who Knows? But the good, bad and ugly, I think that's what it was. <laughs> it's got no part of meditation. <laughs> so anyway, feeling the back, relaxing it. And then look at your arms and hands, just become aware, check them out. Do you need to adjust the position of that part of your body? You get it right at the beginning, nice and comfortable, and it will not disturb you later on. Sometimes I compare this stage of meditation like tucking a baby in the bed, making sure it's comfortable so it can not disturb you later on. And then up to the shoulders. To relax the shoulders, because people do have shoulder pain in meditation in life. They're so tight. When I ask people to relax their shoulders, the question is how? So you may try this little mental exercise of imagining that the muscles, the tendons in your shoulders are a bunch of strings on both sides, stretched, pulled at both ends until they're taut and tight. And when you have that imagination in your mind, that image, then you imagine letting go of both ends of those bunch of strings so they get loose and free. Sometimes, if it works for you, when you imagine that little mental exercise, the real muscles in your shoulders also get released and relaxed. You've let go of something, well done. And then you go to your, your head, oh, the neck first of all, if you need to cough, please do so. Don't try and control any irritations in your throat, they will just get worse. Be kind to them. Relax. Opening the door of your heart, without any conditions, onto the feelings in your throat. Then you go to your head, especially the muscles around the mouth, sorry, and the eyes I usually go to. Because when you're tight, tense, angry, longing, those muscles scrunch up. So by becoming aware of the muscles around the eyes and loosening them, you can feel the muscles Relax. 
But with that, a lot of tightness, a lot of expectation or fear disappears. It's a way of relaxing. Mindfulness gives you the opportunity to get feedback. And the feedback tells you how to relax. Maybe you feel your whole body, whole body sitting here, relaxed, at ease. And if you wish, see if you can notice the happiness, the delight, the very subtle but real pleasure of a relaxed body. Because if you notice that, you will always find that the relaxation goes to another level, much deeper relaxation, carried deeper by the perception of delight. Once our body is relaxed, we can now go on to our mental world, our mind. How relaxed is it? See if you can give a number from one to ten of how relaxed and peaceful your mind is. Number one is really peaceful, number ten is quite agitated. How peaceful, how agitated are you? from one to ten. It doesn't matter what the number is. What is important that you are watching that quality of your own mind which indicates how peaceful or how agitated it is. What I call the peaceometer. Like a speedometer, like a thermometer. It tells you how things are and the moving needle allows you to have feedback. How peaceful are you? How agitated are you? Now what do you need to do? Or not do? To move that needle closer to one and away from ten. You are learning how to be peaceful. The mindfulness of the right area of your mind gives you the opportunity for feedback. Trial and error, you soon learn how to be peaceful. When the mind becomes peaceful, it doesn't need to think. The thinking are like waves on a lake, on the surface. Something else causes those waves. Wanting something, lack of contentment, lack of peace. So by learning to develop peace first of all, 
then the mindfulness and the calmness become strong. <coughs> and then you might start to become aware of your breathing. It's quite natural. If you wish, to be mindful as you breathe in, aware as you breathe out. But keeping also a little bit of mindfulness on how peaceful you are. Always trying to get more still, more peaceful, more content. The more peaceful you are, the more you stay in the present moment. No future, no past. We will never learn from the past. We learn from the present. And the present moment is the place where the future is made. So if you care for the future, guard the present moment. Breathing in. If you wish, breathe in peace. Breathe out, let go. Breathe in peace. Breathe out, let go. Breathe in peace. Breathe out, let go.
getting close to the end of meditation now. How's your peace of it now? How relaxed is your body? What works? What didn't work for you? <coughs> what led you down the mountainside underneath the mist? Led you to more peace? Letting go of the past, not worried about the future. Led you to rest, contentment, a source of happiness. This is the time to reflect on the value of meditation and on its path. So please you may breathe in and out three times mindfully and after the third breath open your eyes but please continue to breathe. Here we go. And out of kindness to whoever who teaches you meditation, please smile at the end of the meditation. Otherwise, the monk or the nun who teaches you will get very depressed. <laughs> That's better. Okay, okay. <coughs> so, now if we're sitting comfortable, we'll give a talk. Um, sorry? Yeah, we have to leave at the end. Everyone has to leave. Talk me. So, anyway, what is the talk again? Oh. You've got to remind me. Really? Yeah, I let go of the part. I live in the present. <laughs> I only told you half an hour ago. Yeah, well, something to do with uncomfort. Real love and uncomfort. Real love. I'd rather fake that. <laughs> but, uh, I went to uh, give a, uh, a discourse in a little section in uh, part of a, a conference on Alzheimer's and dementia. And uh, they said, that the signs of uh, dementia, some signs of dementia, uh, you can't remember the past, you're not worried about the future, and you become socially disengaged. And I thought, well, that's what I teach other people to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm the cause of <laughs> dementia. They go of the past to spend time with solitude people. <laughs> that's from a different angle. So real love, instead of uh, false love, compassion, whatever, is not that hard to see. I've already given you one of the main uh, tricks to find out what is real love and what isn't real love when you were doing a little bit of the body meditations. You can actually feel that, yeah, you might have a bit of tightness somewhere. And what makes it worse? What makes it better? So if it is real kindness, real compassion, real letting go, which is the same word, same thing, but different words. It actually relaxes things. Real love, real compassion. I was taught that by people like my mother, like your mother, that I was came from a poor home. And we used to, I know, people look at that these days as a, uh, a compliment. But it was a real poor home, and I had to, uh, mostly migrants I went to school with, and the, uh, uh, playing soccer in the streets and every time you went for a tackle you scraped the skin off your knees. I often remember the scabs on each knee you know, from the dried blood whenever I play soccer and scrape the, the skin off. And that's probably because even in those times that I actually got a very strong immune system now because you know that's what mothers are supposed to do. They let the, the kids get a little bit of blood on them, a little bit of um, disease or whatever, because that's where you build up your immune system. Don't overprotect them. But anyway, as soon as I you know, scraped the skin off my knees again, you'd run to your mother and cry, you know, in pain, stinging. And my mother would simply um, kneel down and put her mouth, as I say, full of germs onto the open wound. <laughs> 
never ever got infected. But the most important thing was as soon as she kissed it, gave it a little bit of kindness, motherly love, as soon as she did that, the pain went. And I always remembered that. I never thought that that was something important. I thought that was just, you know, what happens? But just giving a little bit of kindness there for a little kid took the pain totally away. And later on in life, I always wondered how that works, why that works. And it is just the kindness teaches the muscles and everything else how to relax and let go. And it's the kindness, the love, which real love is what makes things very loose and open and free and healing. The fake love is what controls <coughs> and what tightens and makes all sorts of terrible things happen. For example, when boy meets girl, or boy meets boy, or girl meets girl, that sometimes they fall in love. Do they really fall in love? I remember reading a nice <coughs> article in the Time magazine, when the Time magazine was uh, a magazine you could read, now it doesn't exist. So those are beyond time now. But anyway, in that magazine, they were just saying, just the chemistry, the biochemistry of falling in love. And all it really was, is no hormones, boy meets girl. You don't really fall in love with them. You fall in love with the way they make you feel. It's, it was totally um, um, unromantic, <laughs> but it was so true. Because the hormones, the smells, and they stimulate this pleasure in you. And they said that is really what that romantic love is. And it's really weird. Human beings these days, they spend so much time looking for a good partner in life and they're just so picky which one they choose. But compare that the love to your partner, which you know sometimes you know it doesn't last Sometimes you love them and then it four falls apart. What compare that to the love to your child? Now Alison, she's going to give birth soon, hope not in the next couple of hours. <laughs> but whatever comes out of that big bump there, I told her on the way here, now she knows how I feel. <laughs> Whatever comes out there, you'll love unconditionally for the rest of your life, no matter what it does. Which is really quite weird. How come you can give unconditional love to a child, which you don't know what you're going to get, but you can't give unconditional love to the person you choose to live with in life? One, you choose. The other one, you're stuck with. Why? And you can see that sometimes there is love which has expect expectations and love which is free of expectations. One is not, well, to me it's not real love at all. It's not love expecting something back in return. The other one is love which is just giving, expecting nothing back at all. One is actually pure and very powerful and the other one is just like a transaction. So it's wonderful if a person can actually, even if you choose someone in this life, to actually to give them unconditional love. And see what happens. It's a leap of faith to your partner. Say, darling, whatever you do in your life, wherever you go, no matter what you do, I'll always love you. Can you say that? <laughs> as long as you don't have an affair with your secretary, as long as you don't spend too much money, as long as you come home on time, or whatever conditions you have. Is that really good? So when, when I go over to... to uh, <laughs> when I ever go, go over... No, I shouldn't go there, I think I'm better <laughs> stop <this. laughs> I've got to be careful sometimes. I'm just fun, I'm just iconoclastic. In other words, rebellious. So anyway, with uh, the real love, it's a love which gives. And of course, those of you who know some of my books, know my stories, that the place where I 
started to learn real love and not love which expects something back in return and to, to understand its power and its purity was that story with my own father who uh, he died at 16 when I was 16 years of age and when I was only 13 uh, I went to school in Hammersmith and one day he picked me up he finished work early and on the way back in Churchfield Road in Acton he stopped the car and he just turned around and said he wanted to talk to me. A little bit of father-son advice. And this was just gold-plated advice. He said, son, wherever you go in your life, whatever you do, however you turn out, I want you to remember one thing, that the door of my house will always be open to you. I'll never shut you out. Now remember, I'm only 13. A man, boy, you don't understand that much. All I knew it was something very, very important. And so I remembered that. And when I was a monk, one of the nice things about being a monastic, you know, you had some time, free time on retreats, to be able to reflect on these important messages which you hadn't got the time to really explore and deeply understand in the business of life. So, it was important. And he thought about it, reflected upon and explored its meaning. And then, looking back, the house was a council flat and it was very, very poor. And so poor that I always say my father, he didn't worry about locking the door up at night or when he was away. You know, he left the door open and sometimes I asked him, aren't you afraid of burglars? He said, no. Sort of, I hoped that a burglar might come in take pity on us and leave something. <laughs> we were legitimately poor. But, I realized it wasn't his house, or his little flat, which was probably put, fit two of them into that, maybe three of them into this room here. It wasn't that which he was referring to. You know, the, the eureka moment for me was when I realized he was saying the door of his heart was open to me no matter what I ever did in my life. It was love given indiscriminately with no strings attached. No, I was his father. So he was my father, I was his son, and that's all. That's all that was needed. And it was a beautiful moment when I realized that, that he was never ever going to judge me, criticize me to the point he said, right, that's it. I don't want anything to do with you ever again. It was like a blank check, but it was a blank check which I could never write out in cash. Because when somebody gives you that amount of trust and love and freedom, the door of his heart would always be open to me. That meant I just, I just, I just couldn't hurt him. There's no way that I could hurt him. Just I was telling Venerable Chandler on the way here, only from. Um, from Bromley South Station. On the train up to Victoria, there was a guy who recognized me, so he had a free, a free talk from me for half an hour. And on the, the underground train from Victoria to where was it, Stockwell, there was another girl who'd listened to me on YouTube who took selfies. No peace for the wicked, that's what I see. But I don't mind that because it gives people some happiness. So what the love is, what the kindness is, you know, that guy I saw in the tube, he was trying to help people who had heroin addictions. And the people, and I still remember just at that particular time, late 60s, early 70s, many of my friends, my peers, were getting involved in drugs. It was the thing to do in those days. But for me, no. Because when one of my friends, uh, he talked to me on the bus on the 266 back from Hammersmith to Acton. It's amazing the sorts of things you remember. The number of the bus in those days which <laughs> took me from the school to my home. He was talking about how his parents had found out he'd taken some marijuana and how much pain and suffering was given to his mum and dad. And I just could not do that to a father who trusted me so much. You just couldn't bring yourself to hurt him. When somebody said, the door of my heart is open to you no matter what. 
that statement kept me off drugs. Little things like that, how powerful it is to give someone unconditional real love, not expecting anything, but just to give, expecting whatever. It's a trust, it's a love. And that's something, yeah, you do give that to your kids. Sometimes you forget that when bringing up kids, and sometimes you're too afraid for them, you know, you want them to do well in life. And my goodness me, you know, Alison, when you give birth to that kid, <laughs> cut him some slack. <laughs> there was one of, one of the little poems, which from Sun Po in the 12th century uh, from China. And it says, on the birth of my son, families, when a child is born, always want it to become intelligent and successful. I, said Sun Po, who was a Mandarin working for the emperor, I, through intelligence, having wrecked my own life, only hope that my child turns out to be stupid and dull. Then he can live a tranquil life, crowned as by becoming a cabinet minister later on in life. <laughs> And that was just a beautiful little poem from the 12th century China, just about people saying how great intelligence is. It just gets you into trouble. <laughs> that type of intelligence, but the emotional intelligence, that idea to love someone, it doesn't matter if you come you know, top of the class. In fact, these days, you now I tell throughout, throughout the world, in Buddhist, groups, wherever they are, to tell Buddhists, if your child comes in the top 5% at school, or the bottom 5%, both, they are not, you are not good Buddhist parents. That's not Buddhist parenting, that your child goes into the top 5% or bottom 5%. We are told by the Lord Buddha to avoid extremes and walk the middle way. <laughs> so if your kid comes in the middle somewhere, great, that's the best. <laughs> you know the kids, they really love me for saying things like that. Because they go back and tell mummy, daddy, daddy, Ajahn Brahm said middle way. It's okay, so you know, I'm not the best, but I'm not the worst, I'm in the middle. That's the Buddhist way. <laughs> and it, it's true, it takes all the pressure of children these days. You know, you see this, read it in article and article, I don't know if this happens in UK, but places like Singapore, and the worst place apparently is China, mainland China. Kids get screwed up from the early years by the pressure to succeed. And whew, it's a terrible place. Why do you have to get to the top? What love does, real love, is to say the door of my heart is open to your son, no matter wherever you turn out. And in fact, anyway, I was talking to someone, that if you have a kid, please, and if he's smart or she's smart, don't send to university. Number one, it costs an arm and a leg to get there, <laughs> and have student debts, and make them into a plumber, or a bricklayer, or a concrete worker. Because number one, you don't have to waste money on sending to university. Number two, they're much more useful to you and your house. Imagine your son is a plumber. You can call him up any time and you get your plumbing fixed without any cost. And your friends as well, if you want to get on in society and get your neighbours to love you, you say, oh, my son's a plumber. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and you network very well. And even to the point, I've got to be honest with you, this happened only a couple of weeks ago. Over in my monastery in Perth in Serpentine, we've got so many monks, it's very hard to get in there. And so we had a number of candidates wanting to come in for the next opportunity to train as a monk in Australia. You know the one who we chose? A plumber. <laughs> that other people, honestly, aren't other people who had university degrees, PhDs, expert in, in philosophy and even IT. Uh, no, we don't need that. 
a plumber we can use that. So I said, put him in the VIP lane, express lane, he's coming into my monastery. Meet him at the airport, give him a nice hut. <laughs> it's practical stuff. So anyway, you don't have to be a plumber or you can be an electrician. Electricians are really you know, <laughs> worth it. So, they can come. so anyone who really wants to fast track into a monastery, especially once we get a monastery for Anakampa organization, and you want to join, it'll be a year or two before we get somewhere and actually can get people to come in. So, go and get a plumbing degree, <laughs> <laughs> electrician certificate. <laughs> That's much more useful, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, back to, to loving kindness. You don't need, you now everything has its place in this world. So we have this beautiful loving kindness towards all people. That's real love. And you know that real love in the spiritual path, you know, there's something I've said quite a few times. There's something which we people, st I can't understand where they get this from. It's called spiritual growth. And you come to places like meditation, teachings, because somewhere down the line you're convinced there's something wrong with you and you need to be improved. And therefore we get this big industry called spiritual growth, or human growth, or personal growth. Another person was, was telling me, actually this was this, this girl in the train uh, on the way home, sorry, from, yeah, from Victoria down to Stockwell. She was a model and an Indian dancer and listened to me on YouTube. And she said to me that you know, personal growth, you know, on the YouTube channel, what she heard there was just really high quality stuff for free. And he said, you know, some people, some of her friends have to, have to pay a fortune to go to these seminars for personal growth. And it's in Malaysia once, in Kuala Lumpur, this uh, Malaysian Chinese fellow came to see me and he said, you now my father's a multi-billionaire, and he said, I, you know, like I have uh, all sorts of uh, emotional problems, so I went to the Mayo Clinic in Cleveland, United States. That is where film stars go for detox or, you know, whatever. You know, you're not really in the club until you've been for detox and rehab and other such you know, stupid things. And he said he went there, you know, a lot of money to actually to get the airfares and had to pay such a fortune you know, to see these people. It was actually run by John kabat you know, the mindfulness movement. And he said, all the people teaching, they were all Buddhists. And he said, I come here and I get the same teachings from the source, far better teachings, for nothing. He said, I'm stupid, I wasted all that money going overseas when I could got higher quality teachings for free. And this is one of the problems with being Buddhist monks. You know, because we don't charge, people think, that we're not worth it. Woman come phoned up once. I hear you teach meditation. Yeah, I'm a quite a well-known monk now. You know, I've written books on meditation. Some of those meditation books are uh, the one mindfulness books, and beyond that's a, a textbook in Vietnamese universities. Every monk who is uh, studying has to learn that. I said yes, I am. I said how much do you charge? So nothing. And she replied, well, you can't be any good then, and hung up the phone. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? But, you know, sometimes you think, oh, maybe you should charge, but this doesn't really work, because you know, this is love, it's kindness. You know, you've you got this stuff for free, you just want to share it. It doesn't matter, you know, where it goes, how it goes. It's so wonderful to be kind and love and to give expecting nothing back in return. There's something very pure and beautiful in that. So that's what real love and kindness is. Giving, expecting nothing back in return. And you know it's a real thing if it starts to work. I often <coughs> am interested in taking things a bit further when often during meditation retreats people understand that you're supposed to let go. And that's quite clear, all teachings, all traditions, you know, to let go, relax, you know, be kind. But then people start to say, 
how do I let go? The most legitimate question. Well, yeah, I know I should do, but how do I let go? Come on, let go. Let go. Come on, look, how many times do I have to tell you? Let go. Let go. I'm trying to let go. And so people get so confused because they, they don't know how to let go. And even compassion, kindness, real compassion, real kindness, like opening the door of your heart. That's better, but people sometimes, yeah, well, what would happen then? So that sometimes they don't know what to do and how to do it. So in that little uh, body awareness exercise at the very beginning, I've developed that and emphasized that not just to have a healthy body and learn how to relax, but also to discover what is letting go, what is real love on your own body. Because you might take an ache or irritation in your body. It can be sort of a sniffles, the beginning of a cold. It can be out of the contractions later on when the birth process starts, but not now, please. <laughs> please behave. <laughs> but when those pains actually happen, or when you do have an ache, when you do have a stomach ache, or you do have any other problem in your body, you can be mindful of that, aware of it. And if you truly give it kindness, compassion, real love, real love always relaxes and heals. Just like my mother kissing my injured knee and it felt better straight away. Real kindness, real compassion softens. It's the antidote to fear and control. Fear and control makes everything tense. Kindness relaxes. I remember this from the time I was a Boy Scout. On the way here, I just asked Renal Chanda when she was a young girl whether she joined the Brownies. <laughs> well, she did now, anyway. <laughs> but real kindness and real compassion, it relaxes and opens things up. So, you can take something in your body which is aching, which is a pain, it can be a cold, it can be an irritation, it can be irritable bowel syndrome, it can be whatever. You focus on it and experiment with kindness, compassion, letting go. Play around with that concept. Let go, no, it's getting worse. That can't be letting go. Be kind to open the door of your heart to it and it's getting worse because what you're really doing I'll open the door to my heart to it as long as it gets better. I'll let go as long as, as Bajan Bam says, it will disappear. That's not real letting go, is it? It's a deal again. So what real compassion is, it relaxes. It opens things up. Ask nothing back in return. And you start to find as you play around with an ache or a pain, a stress, a tightness in your body, if it is real kindness, the ache, the pain, the tension, the difficulty lessens. It gets less. It heals, it relaxes. Have you ever gone into a room and there's a really, really nasty person in that room and you feel really tense and tight? And sometimes you go into a room and there's people who are just so kind, they ask nothing of you, they're not going to judge you and you feel so relaxed. One of the other examples, uh, I would call it ultimate kindness, there was one monk who was always, uh, always had a very, very good reputation. One of these monks, when I first went to Thailand, he was in hospital with cancer and the doctors gave up on him. You know, you're not going to leave his term, we've done everything, we can't help you. So he said, I'll go and die in my monastery, you know, up in the north next to the Mekong. And another 24, five years later he died. <laughs> But he was such a great monk, I went to go and see him. Because I had all these questions on meditation, on Buddhism, on compassion, kindness. I went up to him. I had to you know, be in a queue you know, before I got my opportunity to, to be inter interview him or be interviewed and ask my questions. You know what happened? As soon as I went into his presence, all my questions, they just evaporated. They just disappeared. You know why? Because he was such a beautiful, kind monk. 
I didn't need any questions anymore. It was total accepting me as I was, with all my stupidity, all my idiosyncrasies. The door of his heart was totally open to me. I didn't need to improve. It was just total acceptance and real love. And because of that, my mind got so peaceful. Any defilements, any wanting aversion vanished on the spot. And there was, the thought came up <laughs> that they're going to have to drag me in chains next to an elephant to get me out of this room. I'm going to die here. I'm going to spend the rest of my life just right in this room next to this incredible mind who gives me so much peace and, and love and acceptance and freedom. Your mind gets incredibly peaceful and still when you don't judge it, when you love it and have it wonderful acceptance. That's what I do with my body. That's what I do when I meditate. I'm a stupid man, do terrible jokes, often get in trouble with it, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to open the door of my heart to myself no matter what, what happens. Totally relaxed, totally at peace, totally free. So check it out on your body first of all. You've got a sickness, an ache, a pain, whatever it is you've got. Play around, experiment, trial and error. But with the mindfulness, if it really is compassion, real love, just um, stomach ache, door of my heart's totally open to you. You're okay. You don't need to get better. You're fine. It heals. Straight away, usually. I, that's one of my tricks from the world, Chanda. The, what was happened once, oh that career, minus 15 degrees centigrade, really cold. So, you know, I got a cold, I got the sniffles. And I had to give a talk in front of TV, live TV. You know, across national TV in Korea. Ah! Have you ever seen anybody, actually apparently that happened to Theresa May, the Prime Minister. She coughed and she almost ruined her career. If she had learned, if she'd have come to me and learned this meditation technique, she would be fine. <laughs> so easy. <laughs> so this is what happened to me. I was going to go on live TV and I was sniffing. Have you ever heard someone being interviewed on live TV? <laughs> and washing their nose and then having to sneeze during the interview. And it, you just can't do that, it's just nasty. So anyway, half an hour, sitting in the room and just watching this really irritating, itchy feeling in the bridge of my nose and giving this beautiful love and kindness. There. And poor little nose. I don't know why this has happened to you, but I care for you, nose. May all your smells be fragrant ones. May all the irritations just relax and be peaceful. Imagine my little mother kissing the bridge of my nose inside where all the irritation was. And with that kindness and compassion, real compassion, because I've been practicing this for years, the irritation just eased and eased and eased. And after half an hour, no cold, no need for any tissues, nothing, fine. Well, when I was in Indonesia once, I just, at the end of a talk, I had to leave early, like I'm supposed to leave early today. But that time was because I was about to vomit. <laughs> and I did that once on stage <laughs> to prove to people I do have a sensitive stomach. <laughs> so this time, I don't know what I ate, because you know, people give you food, you hope it's the best, but you don't know it's what they think they like. But you know, sometimes not what you can stomach, that's muck, none business. But anyway, I was about to vomit and said, I need to go back. I said, no, one more question. Photograph. Yeah, if you want, see me vomiting again and catch that on YouTube. <laughs> but, so I managed to really run away, get to my room, as soon as you're in the room, <laughs> you know, very violent vomiting. Get it out of the system. But then, you only had about four or five hours to sleep before you had to go to your next city for the next um, talk. So, I've got to get some sleep. So it's wonderful. You, know, you feel this stuff which is still rumbling. There's still stuff inside that's had to come out, but you know, not yet. It's enough for this evening. And just give this beautiful kindness. Beautiful kindness. And that's, you know that, that feeling you have when you're about to vomit, that's sick and it's very unpleasant. 
And then you look at it, and you just, instead of trying to get rid of it, getting negative towards it, you open the door of your heart to it. You love it, you're kind to it. It's okay, Tommy. It's okay to have a feeling like that. And after a little while, I fell fast asleep. Mm. And when I woke up, straight to the toilet, <laughs> but having about four or five hours sleep, really peaceful sleep. You know, just getting the last bit out. No problem at all. So it's amazing what you can do if you have real loving kindness. It works, it really does, health-wise. But it also really works on the, uh, the meditation. Because sometimes, you know what people do? They're always trying to, to control their mind, make it peaceful, make it still, get this or get that. When you're trying so hard, you're a control freak. It never works. You're just you're trying to do something in your life, be famous or worrying about Mental Health Week this week apparently here. It's Mental Health Week over in Australia too. Must be international. And a few years ago I was invited to give a, a session for Mental Health Week to the clients, they call them clients of the mental health industry. In other words people who had uh, been diagnosed as OCD, depressed, schizophrenic and I, I don't know all the acronyms anyway but What's wrong with being schizophrenic? What's wrong with being uh, OCDC or... I used to know ACDC, <laughs> but... <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, what's wrong with these things? And that was the main part of my presentation. Who told you there's something wrong with you? And I gave the simile, and those people, English people, would understand this. This uh, lady in Australia came to see me at the end to apologize to me. She said, when I saw you come in to give this half an hour session, I thought, who's this wanker coming in to teach us? <laughs> an English word. <laughs> Not a very polite word. He said, that's what I come to say sorry for because you had me crying and laughing in the same session. Thank you so much. It was amazing, totally unexpected. Because I told her the simile of the forest. Many of you may have heard this, it's, it's one of the most beautiful ones. It's all to do with real love. Anyone who thinks there's something wrong with them, especially those people who feel they're damaged goods. Stupid, stupid word. Go into a forest, have a walk in that forest and find a perfect tree. One which is dead straight with all the limbs in the right place, with no scars on the trunk of that tree, with all the leaves green, no yellow brown leaves and all the leaves not chewed by insects a perfect tree. Can you find one? And the answer is no. Maybe in a, a high class golf course where everything is just plastic and manicured but in a real forest, a natural forest, you will never find one perfect tree. And in fact if you saw one, it would be so boring. Number two, find the most beautiful tree in that forest. And the most beautiful tree will be the one which is bent and crooked. It will have some limbs which have been torn off by the storms of life. And in those holes left by the broken, torn off branches, that's where you'll find animals and birds make their nests and abodes. And you'll find many of those leaves will be dying, especially this time of year, yellow and brown. Don't they look beautiful? <coughs> and you'll find many marks and scars on the bark. The most beautiful trees have been damaged. So, <coughs> if you are damaged goods, if you are not straight, you're crooked and bent, deformed, so-called disabled. Number one, 
You belong in the forest called humanity. And number two, if you are truly damaged, more than most, you are the most beautiful trees. You're the ones I like the most. That's why she wept. Because many people think there's something wrong with them. They're rejected and they feel to be accepted, to be normal, that they have to work hard, self-growth, self-improvement. That is not love. Something wrong with you. Reject it. Do something about it. What I understand is the door of my heart is open to you. Real love. Don't care who you are. <laughs> Don't care how ugly, stupid, um, deformed, damaged, whatever. You belong. And you know it's just I don't know about you, sometimes the people who have been through stuff, they're really interesting people in life. They've got character, they've got beauty in them. So you don't have to be perfect. You know, sometimes I thought, to get us, you know, there's people always looking for new business opportunities. You know, we do have beauty parlours in, in London these days. I want to actually get ugly parlours. <laughs> A chain of ugly parlors, Ajahn Brahm's ugly parlors. <laughs> just number one, as a, as a great statement about just how society demands women to be. And also, number one, to celebrate reality. <laughs> There's nothing wrong <laughs> with being ugly, fat. I celebrate my tummy as much as Alison does. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, if you, <laughs> if you criticise my tummy and just praise Addison's tummy, that would be sexual discrimination, that's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So when you have this wonderful open the door of your heart, number one, you don't feel rejected. You don't feel you have to improve. You're questioning that assumption. You know, even some Mahayana now, the sixth Zen, sixth Zen Patriarch. The path is easy when you have no discrimination. Or something like that. Without preference, yeah. Without discrimination. And you've got no preferences. That's just what I've been teaching. Just you be. As you are. No preference. Not trying to get anywhere. Because when you're trying to get anywhere, you're not being here. When you're not being here, you're not developing. You're not developing peace, and love and happiness. So it's wonderful when you get to the point of saying, I don't need to be anything other than I jump up. Yeah, my robe keeps falling off. Yeah, I still say the same old bad jokes again and again and again. I just can't be controlled. Because I can't even control myself. I love myself. At ease with myself, at peace with myself. That is what I'm trying to convey in these talks. Not just by words, but by gestures and by my costume malfunctions. I <laughs> 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 went to this seminar once of executives and this lady came up at the end, she's some big executive of a big company, you know, headquarters in Perth. And she came up to, and she gave me this very very good comment. She said, as I was looking at you, I wasn't really listening to you, but I was looking at you, and your robe was falling off, it was really loose. And I realized, I compared that to my upbringing in a convent school where all the Catholic nuns were just so tight, bound up like sausages in their <laughs> robes. And he said, that to me was my memory of Catholicism. It was just so tight, so unyielding, so forceful. There was no freedom, no love. That's what she was saying to me. He said, look at you, robes all over the place. He said, that is Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> Disorganized religion. <laughs> From a disheveled monk. <laughs> now there's something which you like about that, isn't there? Because 
What it really does is, is, a, is a beauty, a character, a reality. There are no, I don't know, Germans love the forest. But how many Germans, whenever a, the, any tree is started to bend over in the black forest, actually go and push it up to be straight again? How many of them just sand or plainly the bumps in the, in the trunks so it's nice and smooth? I mean, no one does that. The trees, this is how they are. This is what they're like. Wonderful, great. This is the ones I love the most. The important, that's love. Expecting nothing back in return. That's why Alison will love her kid, even though it will drive you crazy. But you'll love it to bits for the rest of your life, and that's it. No matter what bubs actually come out. Same, that's real love. Like a mother loves her only child. Not the way you love a partner. Although that some, some partners have done that, they take their relationship to a next level. And they literally say to one another, Darling, I really mean this. Whatever you do in your life, whatever it is, the door of my heart will always be there, will be open to you. You may disappoint me, but you're my wife, you're my husband, you're my partner, and that's it. And you'll love you, unconditionally, for the rest of your life. That changes things when it's sincere. You can't fake it. It has to be real. And then your partner will never ever let you down. Because it's something which is so pure, so high, so spiritual. It's like a diamond. You just, you can't lose it. That's a diamond way, which you're asking about. Something so precious that you, if you had like, you know, 10,000 pounds in your bag, when you take it home, you'd be checking it every minute. On the tube, you'd be looking at it, make sure it's still there, because it's so valuable to you. How much more valuable would some wonderful act of love like that be? So that is what we mean by real love. It actually creates harmony, creates peace, creates trust, it raises it up. And the same with meditation. We always want to get rid of our defilements. Ah, oh, too much thinking. Ah, oh, too much sleepiness. Ah, oh, too much, I don't know what else, else you do. Instead of doing that, how about giving love? Absolute love to your mind. Whoever you are, it's fine with me. It's called letting go. Of controlling, craving, wanting to get somewhere. If you're not trying to get somewhere, there's only other, one other place to be. Now, you know to let go of the past and future, we always say be kind to it first. When you give this beautiful kindness to the past and the future, you soften it. It's easy to let it go. When you hate the past, when you're scared of the future, you give it power. And it's too hard to let go. You love the past, you love the future. Oh, whatever happens, whatever happens in my future, good, bad, who knows. Ah, something's nice is going to happen. Whatever happens, I can deal with it. No fear. Always opportunities. So I can love the future. Future, the door of my heart is open to you. Whatever you do. Past, whatever happened to me, ah, oh, that just makes the most beautiful tree in the forest. All the scars, all the disappointments, all the abuse. If you look at it that way, it goes. You're embracing things rather than fighting things. So, path to enlightenment. So easy. Just open the door of your heart to everything. There was last little story. There was a mother in Perth. Had a six-year-old boy. Yes, it was a boy. And the boy at home one day said, you know, through a tantrum, Mummy, I don't love you anymore. I want to leave home. Six-year-old in Australia. So, the mother, really one of the smartest, emotionally intelligent women I know, she said, oh, of course, darling. Of course you can leave home. But let me help you pack, first of all. I know some mothers sometimes think they would like to do that because they're fed up with their kid, but this was not that. This was just incredibly wise. 
And so <laughs> she went into the bedroom, packed the little child's suitcase with all the important things in life, like the Superman costume, the lucky underpants, and the teddy bear. And before, before he went, she said, oh, just wait for a moment, darling. I'll make you a sandwich, your favourite sandwich. So she made her favourite sandwich, put it in a little brown paper bag, and waved her son off at the door. Bye-bye, darling, have a wonderful life. And the child left home for the first time at six years of age. It went to the end of the little garden path, now opened the gate and turned left, and went off into its life, away from home for the first time, with mother's blessing. It got about maybe 100 yards, maybe 50 yards down the street before it started feeling homesick. Turned around. <laughs> Came back through the garden gate, up the, the path where the mother was still waiting. Welcome home, darling. <laughs> that was emotional intelligence. That was real love. Let it go. And it will come back control it, put it in a prison, and the first time it escapes, it will go and never come back. That is real love. That's what uncover is. Be kind to yourself. You're not half as bad as you think you are. And you're not as quarter as bad as you were told you were. You're okay. <laughs> so what do you want to improve? No craving, no striving, you're fine. Okay, now, questions and answers. Anyway, questions first. Yes, go on. <clears throat> if we, all of us here, would feel um, okay and fine, I don't think we would be here. Exactly! And then I could have some peace and quiet. <laughs> <laughs> because we want to improve. Yeah, and I'm telling you, stupid. I don't want to improve. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Nothing. You're good enough. I don't Except have the feeling to be good enough. Sorry? I don't have the feeling to be good enough. Okay, so this is where I have to brainwash you. So repeat after me. <laughs> I am good enough. <laughs> I am right. When I was at school, that's what I used to do. The teacher used to tell you, write down a hundred times, I am good enough. I'm <laughs> It's really, this is really um, confronting our modern world. We're always into development. Develop this, develop that, you know. De and every time you develop, things get more complicated. And just, yeah, you, you develop the transport system and it still gets more crowded. Develop, well, I don't know what else you're going to develop. Always gets more troublesome. Monastery. Monastery, oh, and that's, a, that's an exception. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, as a teacher, my whole purpose of being a teacher is to get rid of people. Think about it. If you were teaching, say, in, in, in a high school, and if your students came back year after year after year, you wouldn't be much of a teacher, would you? So every time I see people who keep coming back year after year after year after year, I think, oh my goodness, I'm hopeless. <laughs> Why did you graduate? They'll be right, be free. <laughs> so this, go on. You yourself spent many, many years in, involving, in improving. Yeah, no I didn't. I'm much worse than when I stopped trying <laughs> to improve myself. <laughs> now it's challenging here, but what's wrong? When you, people imagine, or actually I get sucked into this idea, there's something wrong with you, you're not good enough, you're not perfect enough. Even when you get, say, a cancer. And I tend to spend a lot of time teaching people with, with cancers. And, you know, it's conventional treatment doesn't really work. More and more people get cancers every year. You know, some actually go into remission, but a lot of time it comes back again. They're not getting to the root, root problem. The root problem is if you have a cancer. Wonderful, nothing wrong with that. Let it be, come on. Thank you, cancer, for visiting me. The reason why people get cancers in the first place is so stressed out, so tense. Trying so hard and you get a cancer makes them more stressed. 
the head of the Cancer Wellness Association over in Perth. You know, he twice he's asked the same question. He said, because I think he wanted me to say it in front of others just to confirm it to his followers. He said that uh, fighting a cancer, he said, I never advise people to do that. And he went through cancer himself. It just makes it worse. I said, yeah, exactly. It's not the way to deal with things. It's a stress-related disease to begin with. And if you fight it, you're liable to make it worse. You're feeding it. Should we nuke North Korea? That will make it worse. Like nuking your cancers. There's something fundamentally amiss there. To be kind, open the door of your heart to Kim Jong-un. Thank you for being there, Kim. That will change the whole ball game. Really weird. But we do need something new, something radical, something which changes the way we look at things. And actually that works. There's a, I never mentioned this yet, but one of the most powerful little metaphors, which is in the early Buddhist sutras, but it's only missed by most people. And I used it, developed it, added a few things was the story of the monster who came into the Empress's palace. So there was an Empress and she was out on holiday somewhere, probably coming to a retreat, developing herself or whatever. But anyway, while she was away, this big monster came into her palace. It was so frightening, so smelly, that all of the security who were supposed to guard the palace they you know, hid under the, under the tables, they went into the, the, uh, the cupboards, hid behind the flower pots, anything you know, to hide from this really terrifying monster. And that allowed this monster to walk right through the, the palace and sit on the empress's throne. And at that, that was just going one step too far. So the uh, security, the guard said, Get out of here, you don't belong, you shouldn't sit there, that's our empress's seat. One of those unkind words, the monster grew an inch bigger, more ugly, more smelly, more offensive. And that has been going on for a while, when the empress came back. When she came back, she saw this incredibly big monster, who was so terrifying, because I don't watch movies, People told me, I asked them, what's the most terrifying monster in the movies? And apparently it was Alien. And this monster made Alien look like a pussycat. <laughs> and the smell, the stench which came off this monster was so bad that even the maggots crawling on its skin threw up. They vomited, they couldn't take it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's a monster crawling to complain. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> the Empress, she was in that job position because she knew, she was the wisest. She knew what to do. She saw this really terrifying, stinky, offensive monster. And she said, welcome. Welcome, monster. Has anyone got you anything to drink here? We'd like a cup of tea. We have two types of tea. We have Theravada tea from Sri Lanka, Mahayana tea from China. Would you, would you like something to eat? You know, you're such a big monster. I can ring out for, for pizza because I have monster-sized pizza now. How about, how about a foot massage? And about, have you ever had reflexology? It's really nice, you know, relaxing, really good. So about a dozen of the soldiers just went around one foot because the foot was massive. And the monster really loved that because, you know, just over there, just a bit harder, ooh. You know, sometimes when you go, from, ooh, ooh, that, ooh, that's really good, ooh, yeah, ooh. So the monster was really enjoying his foot massage. And every, every kind act, every kind word, or even kind thoughts, the monster shrank another inch, became less ugly, less smelly, less offensive. And soon it was back to the size when it first came in, and the security never stopped. They kept on being so kind, so caring, that soon the monster got so small 
that it vanished completely away. And that the Buddha called an anger-eating monster. Give it anger, get out of here, you don't belong. And it gets bigger and smelly and more of a problem. Welcome, monster, thank you for visiting me. Do you want something to drink, Kim Jong? Then, would you like a pizza? Would you like a nice visit somewhere? Kindness has huge power. Cancer, thank you for visiting me. Anything I can do for you? That is radical, but I've taught that and it works. This anger-eating monster comes into your palace, sits on your throne, and gets bigger and bigger every time you give it your will. Other people in this world, give them kindness, compassion, and they shrink. The, the boss from hell, if you've got one at work, give them kindness, compassion, and he shrinks, or she shrinks. The anger ill will get less. That is the Dhamma. That's what the Buddha said, but I added many things in that story. The Buddha never talked about foot massage and pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't mind doing things like that. Interesting, we do need another way. Every time I go through England, I always see this big compound, Ministry of Defence. So what an oxymoron. It's not Ministry of Defence, it's Ministry of Attack. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Defence Minister, it's Attack Minister. <laughs> but anyway, so it doesn't work, does it? So can't we have some kindness instead? Open the door for heart. You try and attack your defilements, defeat them in a battle. You finally get worse. You get frustrated. Be kind. Be a tree in the forest, all bent and crooked. You belong. There's no problem anymore. Yeah, go on. Um, I like the first thought of what you're saying, which to me sounds like a person feeling a person thing situation with people to a new person on that like um Coming from a Catholic background, we often hush ourselves when we do bad acts or we speak, speak harshly to people yeah, yeah. and hurt them. Now, I understand that we should not judge ourselves, yeah. feel compassion for our defilement, but uh, at which point the practice comes in? Okay, I feel compassion, um, I don't judge myself for my bad. Uh, no, that is wrong. There's a brain in the world in this one. Yeah. Uh, for my yeah. lack of awareness, because when you see harsh words to someone, when you want to hurt, it's lack of mindfulness and things like that. But at which point I can introduce the practice of improving yeah. uh, something of my personality that, uh, that is a visual. Yeah. yeah. What happens is we when. Are it. Yes. When you accept yourself, you give yourself loving kindness, that's where improvement happens. When you try and chase improvement, it never gets there. No, no kindness, kindness. People always told me, oh that was actually something else. Praise, praise is a very kind thing to do. When you say, you know, what a wonderful question that was, thank you for, for for asking that question. Because there was one time when I was given an award for my service in Perth by a local university, it was a John Curtin Medal. And I went to the award ceremony, I was asked to give a, a speech, an acceptance speech. I gave the speech that, ah, uh, it's a very amazing thing, you gave me this award, uh, but basically, I said, I don't deserve it. There's other people in the community who do much more work than I do. And I couldn't be able to do all that work without the help of all the people who support me, but thank you anyway. And then the next year I went to another award ceremony, the person who got it the year after me. And when he was, you know, he's an amazing person, he was a head haematologist at the biggest teaching hospital we had. 
and he noticed that people who were going through treatment for cancers, they weren't getting much care. Treatment, yeah, but not care. So he used his position to clear out a few people from rooms, to get some rooms. He got a sponsor from a local dairy, and he had the Browns Dairy Alternative Therapy Center, where he gave people who had been having cancer treatment uh, uh, reflexology, Reiki, homeopathy, uh, Tai Chi, what he said, anything which was conventionally weird was allowed there for free. And his, his idea was that at least for half an hour or an hour someone was given one-on-one -on -one personal attention. They were caring for them. And you know, he put his reputation on the line as a very hard-nosed scientist and he did the research afterwards, the follow-ups and had huge, huge um, effect on people's recovery just a little bit of kindness, no matter what it was and he got an award for that and I was so impressed with his work because I know what happens with people with cancer, I deal with them and someone is actually doing something. Well done, I was so proud and impressed and inspired by him. But then he went up to give his speech and he said, well you know I don't really deserve this award, there are other people in the community who do much more work than I do and I couldn't have done this with the help of all my staff behind me. And straight away I thought, hey that was my speech. <laughs> it's everybody's speech. <coughs> because if I praise you, no, 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 no. Many people are better than I am. Many, I couldn't do that without other people to help me. And I thought just how arrogant that was not to accept praise. Because for everyone who got that award, there were some very smart people who investigated you, did the background research, and they made their decision, yeah, you deserve that award. And I thought that if I accept praise, I'll get big head. Nowadays, if someone praises me, I accept it. If I praise you for your great question, <coughs> accept it. You deserve it. That goes against the grain, doesn't it? We're not supposed to accept praise. We think that's going to make us arrogant. It doesn't. It doesn't give us a big head, it gives us a big heart. But criticism, oh yeah, we've got to accept criticism. There's something very wrong there. Because we only accept criticism, we always deflect praise. That is why we think we have to improve. So, you're good enough. You're wonderful. Thank you for coming here. Can you accept that? Not really. <laughs> you got crazy luck. Right? But when that happens, that's where improvement starts. When you accept yourself. Flower or a tree doesn't grow because you put it out of the ground, you stretch it you make it improve, you guard it, you nurture it, you make sure it doesn't get damaged, and then it grows by itself, like a human being, like a human heart. Your growth is a natural process, it gets stunted when you try too hard. Yeah? So if, if, so if you if you get unconditional love, um, say like from your parents, um, and you get attached to them, um, and so there's a danger that I see that when you lose them, um, there's a fear that you know your, your world is going to be torn apart and what are we going to miss them? So how can you um, receive that, especially if they're giving you love, you you know without getting in a detached way, without getting. Well, if it's attached, it's not unconditional. It's dependent on other people. And I often say the greatest act of love is to let somebody go. You know, your child, Alison, will be with you for 10, 20 years, and it'll be off. He wants to sort of find a partner in life, go to the other parts of the world. And that's the time you let it go. But you don't say that I've lost my child because you had it for all those years. You never say that I lost my parents. I never lost my father. 
I gained him for 60, 16 years. It's a wonderful time we had together. And I still have such wonderful memories of him. They can never be taken away. You don't lose people. It's the wrong language, wrong speech. You gained them, you had them for such a long time. Thank you so much. And when it's time to come to let them go, the greatest act of love, say thank you Father. I'll never forget you. Now you are free. I let you go. This has happened so many times. First time was when Jenny and Steve, Steve was an American white water rafter, Jenny, her wife, his wife. And even though he was young and fit, he got this terrible cancer. So I went to go and see them in their little apartment, you know, regularly. And it got to the point, you know, this really strong, fit guy was just just a skeleton covered with bones. He heard me, he's supposed to die. But he didn't. And then I went in there and wanted one day, something happening here, what's wrong? And then straight away just you know, insight came up, you saw what was going on. And I said to Jenny, Jenny, have you given Steve permission to die yet? And this was his partner, she understood immediately. She never said anything to me. She jumped up on the bed, and very gently, because you know, cancer people at that stage were very fragile, put her arms around him, cradled him, looked him in his eyes, said, Steve, you can go. You can go with my blessing. I love you so much, you can die. It was wonderful moments to see that to see that somebody else loved you so much they can say, you can go. And of course he died that night. Imagine if you were Steve. <coughs> Someone who loves you so much you, can't, you don't want to hurt them. The last thing you want to do in your, your life is to bring tears and sadness to your daughter, to your loved one. So many people hang on in pain, in suffering, because they don't want to hurt others. I've seen this so many times, when that point comes in a loved one's life, and they're not dying, they should do. Go up to them, hold them, say, darling, I love you so much. You can go. Be free. Though my heart's open to you, no matter what happens, I'll never forget. Please go. That's real love. It's beautiful. And you see what happens then. A few minutes later, an hour, whatever, they let go, they've got permission, and off they go. You don't want your loved ones to suffer, but they will, because they don't want you to suffer either. That's real love. And you know it's real love, because it's beautiful. You go there and you cherish those memories. You feel so privileged to be a part of those moments where people show what love really is. Not attachment, but letting go. Um, yeah? Some people criticize us, so what we should do? Might, ah. Sometimes they might be right. Yeah, oh yeah, they might be right. So, quick, very quick, if somebody criticizes you, if they call you a dog, look at your bottom, see if you've got a tail. If you haven't got a tail, you're not a dog, end of problem. If you haven't got a, do a tail, say, oh, thank you, you're right. There's nothing, nothing to be ashamed of, of being wrong. It's only because people think that they have to be perfect, they have to improve. But they fight back. They fight back. Then when people say they're wrong, because they're trying to improve, they reject it. Seems like backwards, but that's what people do. When you find it's okay to be wrong, you don't have to be perfect, you have to be bent, crooked tree. You make a mistake, oh yeah, made a mistake. Sorry about that. I love telling people about my, my another one I didn't tell about one of my mistakes. I was in Penang, and just before boarding the aircraft, they gave me this really delicious, uh, milky, sugary coffee. <laughs> Terrible for your health but oh, it tastes nice. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so thick, I was, they gave it to me, 
and I tried to suck it through the straw, but the straw was blocked. So I sucked it really hard, and still nothing came through. And I sucked it even harder, and I saw all of my, my uh, disciples over there, you know, Chinese Malaysians, just out of respect, they wouldn't tell me what I was doing wrong, but what they were doing, they're covering their mouths, trying their hardest not to laugh. <laughs> so I realized there was something wrong. <laughs> so I took out the straw, and I realized it wasn't a straw, it was a spoon. <laughs> you know those plastic spoons? Now, when I was a lay person and drank those things, they had real straws, you know, a straw with a hole in it. it exactly, we didn't have plastic spoons, we had the, you know, the metal ones, and they were flat. So not like these ones they have in coffee shops these days. I don't know how you can stir them, you know, stir them up with those ones. Why not about the old-fashioned spoons, you know, the metal, with the big, you know, bottom one, you can really stir it up properly. So, <laughs> so I was sucking through a spoon. And they never told me until I made an idiot of myself. <laughs> Did I make an idiot of myself? I've told that story so often it makes people laugh. I bring happiness to the world. <laughs> So when you tell the stupid things you've done in your life, a great happiness. That's why I like telling stories of all the stupid stuff I did. When I was in Thailand with Ajahn Chah, you know, the early days, it was, a, it was a poor monastery. So when we needed anything like soap or toothpaste, he'd have this big water jar, yeah, I know it's a tankum, big water jar and have all this stuff in it and we'd have to, if it was there, you can have some. If it wasn't there, I'm sorry, we don't have any. So. I had to ask for some soap. The Thai word for soap was subu. I said sopo. Very close, subu, sopo. He said, what do you want sopo for? And actually sopo means pineapple. <laughs> I thought I said subu, soap. But I actually came out as a pineapple. What do you want? This is what Ajahn Chah heard, pineapple. To wash myself. <laughs> and he burst out laughing. And for the next week he told all the visitors, oh, these people in London, you know, in London, they're very advanced. They wash with pineapples, you know. <laughs> There's so many stupid things I did. That's why Ajahn Chah had so many Westerners. It caused him so much laughter and happiness. <laughs> With all the stupid things we got up to. But what happened, we never got scolded when we made a mistake. It was just another beautiful story to tell his Thai visitors <laughs> about just happiness. So we learn how to laugh at ourselves, to laugh at life, and never be afraid of making mistakes. In fact, every time you make a mistake, please share it. Share your mistakes, make people laugh. Compassion, make more people happy in life. So never hide your mistakes, just spread them around for the happiness and well-being of all people. <laughs> we got time for another question? Okay, another question then. We really have to go. When we go, we're going out the door, not stopping, because, yeah, we've got to uh, go to the next appointment. Okay, yeah. Uh, planning in detail or going with the flow. Uh, yesterday we thought of putting everything behind in whatever situation we are yeah. in life because life is uncertain. And then we are putting everything, then we are trying to plan, you know, to, to the second, which tube I'm going to take, which bus. And then sometimes you just go with the flow. Yeah. And then you get confused whether you should go this approach or that approach. Well, I must admit, in my life I always go with the flow. Because it's something I've found out in the years I've lived so far, is if you don't plan things, it goes wrong. <laughs> If you do plan things, it still goes wrong. <laughs> Either way it goes wrong. So I decide to enjoy myself before it goes wrong, by not worrying about it. <laughs> Very simple philosophy. You get there in the end. But you've got to be kind to other people, you know, who are planning whatever you do. So, for them, out of comp compassion and kindness, I'll do what I'm told. <laughs> Now, Vinod Chand is doing really hard work. And for all that you know that this is the Adukampa Bikuni project, so we can have Bikunis in England. So that means that she's not a homeless one. I said this is not the, uh, not the Anukampa Bikuni project, this is 
the Chanda camper because she hasn't got a place to stay. She's a camper. An <laughs> itinerant. <laughs> the homeless one. The Chanda camper. Put it. <laughs> to try and get a home. Because on the, on, the, you know, on the just the way here, on the train from, from Bromley South to uh, Victoria first of all, you pass Battersea Dogs Home and Cats Home. <laughs> Even homeless dogs and cats have got somewhere to go to, but not homeless bikunis. It's really embarrassing, isn't it? It's really oh, beautiful. Battersea Dogs Home, beautiful place now. You could share it. <laughs> yeah, you're a cool cat. No, no, dog. <laughs> dog. I'm not a dog. dog. You're allergic to cats. Okay, anyway, dog's home. Can you go woof woof? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, be not in public. <laughs> not in public. Okay. Uh, so shall we go? Or do, uh, We've got, um, as long as we go at four, we're good. Oh, okay, yeah. Four, okay. Mm. So, another question, yeah? So the question would be, um, there are places where people who are used to take, take, take dogs, giving back, Loving kindness that can be played or uh, practiced absolutely, but yeah. one, there is, there's no one who get emptied, you know. There are places and people who take a lot. Yeah. So the attitude would be just to get used to this and not to fear dying or change something. Okay. There's seven monks in the cave. Once upon a time, there were seven monks meditating in a cave. Really a uh, beautiful cave deep in the jungles. And the seven monks were as follows. Listen carefully because I'm going to ask you a question on this. <laughs> Feedback, audience participation. The seven monks were as follows. There was a head monk. There was his brother. There was his best friend. The fourth monk was the enemy. They just had a personality crash. They just didn't get on. The fifth monk was a very old monk so advanced in years could die any day. The sixth month was a very ill monk who was also so infirm no one knew who would die first, the old monk or the ill monk. And the seventh monk was the useless monk. Every time they did chanting he was always off key. Every time they meditated he'd fall asleep and snore. He could do nothing right, he was a useless monk but he was there anyway. And I always mention at this point that all monasteries have one. <laughs> So when you get your Bikuni monastery, you'll have one, at least. <laughs> and they were practicing loving-kindness meditation, and one day this band of thieves, they found that cave in the middle of the jungle, they realized an amazing uh, place where they could hide after the theft or the murders until the heat went down, the police would never find them there, and they could store all their ill-gotten stolen goods. Perfect location, only one problem the monks had found it first. So, they wanted to kill all the monks to keep the location of the cave secret. But the head monk, who was a really good talker, should have been a second-hand car salesman or a politician, something like that, but was the head monk. He said, well, the reason why you want to kill us is that you want to keep the location secret. You don't have to worry, we won't tell. You know, we keep our word if you let us all go for free. And the head of the thieves said, well, yeah, but I've got to sh give you a warning. So I'm going to kill one of the monks in front of all the others as a warning that we're serious. If you tell where this location of the cave is, we'll come for you and we'll kill you all. That was the best deal the head monk could do. One of the monks had to be sacrificed so all the rest could go free. And the question is, which monk was chosen? So imagine you were the head monk. Who would you choose? Now, I'll just go through the list again. The head monk, there was his best friend who would do anything for him. Same with the brother who would sacrifice himself for everybody. The third, fourth monk was the enemy, always causing trouble in the community. The fifth monk was a very, Ill, very old monk. Who, he's going to die anyway soon. Same with the next monk, the sixth monk, who was on death's door. And lastly, the useless monk, throughout his whole life and never ever contributed you know, to anybody. It was always useless. So if you were that head monk, who would you choose? Any suggestions? The old monk. The old monk. Now that's wrong. Anyone else? 
Himself? himself? No. Those of you who think himself, put your hand up. You're all wrong. <laughs> you know, I told this in Sacramento once, there's a bishop, an Anglican bishop was there, and he got it wrong. He put his hand up, sacrificed himself, and said, you're wrong. And he was, he, in the end, when he got the answer, he was really impressed. He said, can I use that in my next sermon? He said, yep. So the answer is, so actually so we can leave on time, the answer was, he could not choose. There's no way he could choose. His love for his brother was exactly the same, no more, no less, than his love to his best friend, as the love to his enemy, as the love to the old monk, the sick monk, and even the useless monk, the dear old useless monk. He loved them all equally. And most importantly, what the bishop never got until afterwards, he loved himself no more, no less than all others. And I told the bishop, the Anglican bishop, don't you remember your Bible, your teacher Jesus, who told you, love your neighbour as yourself. Never said love your neighbour more than yourself, as yourself, which means to love yourself as your neighbour, no more, no less. And that's where he got it, he said, oh, that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, you are compassionate towards yourself as much, no more, no less than you're compassionate towards others. If you give to others, you have to give to yourself. If you give so others, who did the bandit take? A great, great answer. This is actually based on the, the Talaputta Terra um, uh, in the Theragata. In, this is one of the, the uh, sayings of the elders. It's only based on that loosely. I've added a lot. In the end, the leader of the bandits was so impressed with the answer, was really inspired by that. They decided not to kill any of those monks, but to let them all be free. Half of those thieves became monks themselves. The other half went to the village and so stopped thieving. Sometimes people say, well, that doesn't make any sense. It does. But it does. Inspiration. When people have real meaning, something which is not dogma, which really goes to the heart, changes people. Changes people at a very, very deep level. How can you kill a monk like that? Or a nun like that? It just can't be done. So, that's the answer to the question. Okay, so, now's the time to run away. <laughs> so hopefully you've learned how to love uh, Ajahn Brahm and to love Venerable Chandra so much, the greatest act of love is to let us go <laughs> without trying to get a photo of it. And also, the other greatest act of love letting go is to let go of all of your um, uh, cash and stuff <laughs> into that bucket over there. Pledges we accept IOUs for the happiness and benefit of getting a nice place for our homeless camper now. Okay, very good.